Only he who wants to be the best and give his best religion to them. Allah, our God, is the greatest. The one and only glory to him. He only he who wants to be the best and give his best religion to them. Rasul Allah, Habib Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. All praises due to Allah alone. We praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, none can show Him guidance. May the greatest peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Today's episode is number seventy-five in the new series of the Prophetic Etiquettes and Manners. With a new chapter, we begin today's episode. Babu Adal al Khairi. The reward of a person who guides to what is good. The reward of a person who guides to what is good. This is a, a very important uh, chapter, by the way. It has only one hadith, but it really means a lot and it is highly encouraging. The hadith is narrated by a companion known as Abu Mas'ud al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu. Qala, jaa rajulun ila al-Nabiyy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqal, inni ubdi'a bi fahmilni. Qala la ajid, walakin i'ti fulanan, fala'allahu an yahmilak, fa'atahu fahamalahu. فأتى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأخبره فقال من دل على خير فله مثل أجر فاعله أبو مسعود الأنصاري may Allah be pleased with him said once a man came to the messenger of Allah peace be upon him and said my camel was exhausted so give me a mount I don't have a ride the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, replied, Well, I don't have any, but go to so and so, and perhaps he will give you one. So he went to that man, and he gave him a mount. So the man returned back to the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and told him that what happened, and the man that you sent me to him uh, actually gave me a mount. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Whoever guides to good has the like of the reward of the person who actually does it. Whoever guides to good has the like of the reward of the person who actually does it. I like to repeat it. Whoever guides to good has the like of the reward of the person who actually does it. Wallahi, this is such great news. Here the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, says, uh, when a man asked him for a ride because he lost his camel. It died and he doesn't have a ride. And in some narration said that he wanted to partake in one of the battles and he didn't have a ride. And that's why he was hoping that the Prophet ﷺ will find a mount for him. He said, وسلم, I don't have any. And we remember on the battle of uh, Tabuk, or what is known also as Ghazwatul Usra, the battle of hardship, which took place on the ninth year after the migration of the Prophet, وسلم, and it was the final battle that the Prophet وسلم, attended before his demise. Many of the companions who wanted to join. But the Prophet ﷺ could not afford to give them rides. Already, every three and four companions used to take turns on the back of the same mount, horse or a camel. So the Quran recorded their genuine reaction when they returned crying. So Allah the Almighty said, وَلَا عَلَى الَّذِينَ إِذَا مَا أَتَوْكَ لِتَحْمِلَهُمْ قُلْتَ لَا أَجِدُ مَا أَحْمِلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ 
تولوا وأعينهم تفيض من الدمع حزنا ألا يجدوا ما ينفقون And there is no blame upon those who could not afford the ride. So they came to you and they asked you if you can take them. With you he said, I don't have rides for you. I don't have mounts to take you with me. So they returned, but not happy, rather sad. And they were crying. They felt sad that they couldn't afford the ride and they missed the great battle of Tabuk. So either was, uh, it was on one of these battles when the Prophet ﷺ didn't have enough mounts for everyone or one of the companion who lost his uh, mount and he came to the Prophet ﷺ asking him for one and he at the time the Prophet ﷺ didn't have any. But he said, you know what, go to so and so whom the Prophet ﷺ predicted that he might have an extra ride and he wouldn't mind giving it to him. Go and speak to him. He might give you one. He went. And when he said that the messenger of Allah sent me to you and he said, if you have an extra ride, please give it to me because I don't have one. Mine has died. So the man happily give him one for free. The man returned back to the Prophet ﷺ full of joy and he was very delighted and he said, Ya Rasulullah, actually he gave me a ride. So the Prophet ﷺ was happy as well. And he remarked saying, whoever guides to good will have the like reward of the one who actually does it. Even though I didn't give you the ride, but I shall receive a similar reward of the person who gave it to you. Why? Because I have guided you to him. And this is very, very inspiring, brothers and sisters, because it simply means not because you don't have the means, you don't do anything. I can do a lot. I can speak to people who have the means to support. And when they support, I will receive a similar word. The good news is, without diminishing the reward of either one of them. In, in the case of commissioners, business deals, the commissioners, they take a percentage, 2%, 3%, the brokers take 5%, you know, from what? From actually, sometimes from the seller and from the buyer as well. So their profit will be diminished. But in this case, the reward is the same if somebody earned 1,000 good deeds, the one who showed him and guided him to the good will receive a similar reward without diminishing nor affecting the reward of either one of them. Good news. Islam is inviting us to be proactive, not to turn a blind eye and a deaf ear and say, who cares? It's none of my business. I have nothing to do with you. And why are you asking me? No. وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Help one another to achieve what is righteous and what is uh, perceived as piety. Any door of goodness, enter it. Any good cause, participate in it. Sometimes physically, sometimes financially. When we have a small organization where people donate money, and others who don't have money, but they are physically fit, they get together, they bring their children and their friends, they buy the food, the rice, the grains, oil, the butter, and they pack them, and they work on the distribution. I can only afford to volunteer some of my time, or some of my effort, a similar word. Well, I spoke to this businessman and I said, MashaAllah, there is a good cause here. And uh, I think if you support it, you will earn a magnificent reward. So MashaAllah, he responded and he participated. He donated one million. You have earned a similar reward as if you have donated another one million. Even you didn't donate one million. 
I'm saying that because we are in a current situation. Subhanallah, what is happening in Palestine, where we see our brothers and sisters lining up in long queues for any leftover food, drink, catastrophe, disaster. And mashallah, the ummah is rich. The Muslim ummah is very rich. And we are over 2 billion Muslims. People in the Gulf, very rich. And they throw food left over in abundance, crazy. You see the amount of food which is thrown away in the trash. You think, subhanAllah, all of that is being wasted and thrown in the trash. While there are hundreds of millions of people, not only in Gaza, they are starving sometimes to death. That is not fair. That is not fair. Is it possible that to cook and serve only what is needed without being extravagant? Without being extravagant. It's supposed to be this way, but this is not happening. So at least if you're very well off and you don't mind uh, cooking a whole camel for only five people, at least consider those who are starving. You don't say, uh, this is none of my business. Well, I care about only my people and my country. Islam doesn't recognize borders. Islam is a religion without borders. It is a universal religion. Like when we know that there was an earthquake in Turkey, there was another earthquake in Morocco, and there is a landslide here and there, and there is a disaster in, um, in Burma, I haven't been to Burma, I haven't been to Bangladesh. You know that people are in need there, you should rush to help. Then whenever they are Muslims, and then they are being persecuted, they're being uh, suffering, then it becomes incumbent on the entire Ummah to support them, to support them financially, militarily, uh, morally, physically, with the dua by every possible mean. But turning a blind eye and a deaf ear and pretending that nothing is happening in our country so I don't care about others, wallahi, even if they are not Muslims. You know, it's very uh, uh, ironic that every time there is a hurricane, a tornado, in one of these Western countries, you find many of the wealthy Muslims, especially in the Middle East, writing big checks, 50 million, 100 million, and donating generously, donating to the United States, to the state of Louisiana, to the state of Texas, to the state of New York. These guys don't need your money. They don't need your money. They can print as much dollars as they want. No one is asking them. But those poor people who are dying out of starvation, their own, your own flesh and blood. They're your Muslim brothers and sisters. Why am I saying that now? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Man dalla ala khayrin falahu mithlu ajri fa'ali. In case that some of these wealthy guys do not know that it is our duty to support those human beings who happen to be Muslims, who happen to be protecting our holy lands, who happen to be persecuted and massacred, we owe them support, we owe them to feed them, to provide them with shelter. So if somebody hears me and then they react and they support, all of us will be rewarded. Whoever guides to good has the like of the reward of the person who actually does it. MashaAllah. May the greatest peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Next chapter, Babu al-Afwi wa safhi an-nas. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said uh, in, in, in this chapter, which is about pardoning and forgiving people, excusing and pardoning 
people. The first hadith we have is hadith number 243. In this hadith, Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu narrated أن يهودية أتت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بشاة مسمومة فأكل منها فجئ بها فقيل ألا نقتلها قال لا قال فما زلت أعرفها في لهوات رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that a Jewish woman brought the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, a poisoned sheep. He ate out of it and uh, then she was summoned. The people asked, O Prophet of Allah, shouldn't we kill her? He said, no, he replied. Anas radiyallahu an said, I continue to recognize the effect of that poison in the ovula of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. What is the story of this uh, poison sheep and so on? Khaybar. Khaybar is a tribe lived outside uh, Medina. Jewish tribe, big Jewish tribe who plotted a lot against Muslims, funded the Arab and the Bedouins to attack al Medina. They funded the Meccan army before. They provided them with weapons, despite the fact that they have treaties with the Prophet and Muslims. Similar to Bani Qainiqa, Banu Quraidha, and Banu Nadir. So they experienced a similar fate. On the fifth year after the migration, the Meccans led an army of 10,000 people. This army was formed not only from Quraysh, no, Quraysh, Ghatafan, Kinana, many other tribes and Bedouins came all the way even from Najd, hundreds of miles away. And that was funded by the Jews of Banu Nadir and Khaybar. Allah the Almighty recorded this entire event in Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter number 33, which is known as the Confederates, Al-Ahzab, the Allies. Because all those people gathered together and put their effort together to eliminate Islam and Muslims, and their target was to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions. Their mission was not accomplished, Alhamdulillah. And you know the outcome after three weeks of besieging al Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a violent wind which blew away their tents and their food and sand in their eyes. So Abu Sufyan didn't have a choice but to leave and he said maybe next year. Rasulullah peace be upon him said from now on we shall invade them and they will not invade us anymore. Good news alhamdulillah. A few months later, on the sixth year, the Messenger of Allah saw a night vision that he was performing uh, Umrah. He shared that with his companions and 1400 of his companions joined the Messenger of Allah, dressed up in Ihram. They brought the head along with them to be sacrificed in Mecca. So 1400 uh, have no weapons but their swords in their sheath, in their cases. When they approached Mecca, they were so close. Uh, in a place called Al Hudaybiyah, the Meccans declared that we will never let you enter Mecca, even though we know you're coming to perform Umrah and you're coming peacefully, you're dressed up in Ihram and you have the Hajj. This whole scenario ended up with what is known as the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah, which gave them 10 years of ceasefire. Ceasefire. Yes, they were not uh, able to perform Umrah this year, but they were given a promise that they will be permitted to perform Umrah next year, which he did. 
on the seventh year. And among the terms of the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah, 10 years of ceasefire. The Prophet ﷺ was very happy with the treaty because of the ceasefire for 10 years. He achieved a lot. Like, number one, he took care of the Jews of Khaybar. He marched with his army on the beginning of the seventh year of uh, Hijrah, particularly on the month of Muharram. And he besieged Khaybar. Khaybar was one of the most powerful Jewish tribes. And they have many, many fortresses not only one, very powerful fortified fortresses and farms. The outcome was they were utterly defeated. And Salam ibn Mishkam, one of the Jewish rabbis and Jewish chieftains, one of the worst enemies of Muslims, was killed. His wife, Zainab bint al-Harith, by the way, Salam ibn Mishkam also was married to Safiya bin Tuhiyay ibn Akhtab, the chieftain of Banu Nadir before, whom later on she accepted Islam, and she got married to the Prophet sallallahu and she became one of the mothers of the believers. So, Salam ibn Mishkam was pure evil person, always plotting against the Prophet and against Muslims. Now his wife, Zainab bint al-Harith, decided to do two things. Number one, to take revenge for the death of her husband. That was after the conquest of Khaybar and their defeat and their surrender. And he begged the Prophet ﷺ to let them live in their homes and cultivate and share some of uh, the produce with Muslims. And the Prophet ﷺ said, will let you live in it for a while. But if you ever betray, if you ever, if we ever find out again that you are funding any campaign or military campaign against us, then you will be removed from Khaybar. And they agreed. And eventually when they did so during the time of Umar ibn Khattab, he evacuated all of them from the peninsula. Now, Zainab bint al-Harith inquired about what the Prophet sallallahu likes most of the sheep. She was informed that he likes the shank, al katif So she poisoned the whole sheep and she put extra poison in the shank. And then she invited the Prophet ﷺ for dinner. Watch and listen carefully. This incident narrated in many sound hadith. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, accepted the invitation along with some of his companions such as Bishr ibn al-Bara ibn Ma'roor, may Allah be pleased with him. And they all went to eat the dinner. The Prophet ﷺ took a bite and he said, lift your hands, stop eating. They said, what is wrong? She cooked the sheep very well. He said, the sheep spoke to me and she said that there is poison inside of me. Don't you eat, spit it out. Bishr ibn al-Bara ibn Ma'roor had already eaten a few bites and he was poisoned badly. The Prophet ﷺ spat out the bite which he put it in his mouth, but he was poisoned as well. Now they summoned the woman and the Prophet ﷺ asked her, why did you do that? I mean, I accepted your invitation, we're in peace. She said, I wanted to find out if you are a true prophet or an imposter. I figured if you are a true prophet, God will save you and will inform you. And subhanallah, it didn't come as a means of wahi. Rather, Allah made the sheep speak out. You know, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter number uh, 5, verse number 67, the Almighty Allah says, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. When this ayah was revealed, it was a confirmation that no one will be able to touch the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He doesn't. He did not need any bodyguards or any security anymore. He was literally untouchable. Masha Allah. So from now on, he doesn't walk around with even people to protect him or bodyguards or security. So now he ate from the uh, the sheep. He took a bite and he spat it out. Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu said, 
I still was able to see the effect of the poison في لهوات رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم which is the ovula that is hanging here in the throat like whenever he speaks he would see like a dark spot and as a matter of fact the messenger of Allah peace be upon him prior to his death he said صلى الله عليه وسلم I still suffer from the poison of the sheep of Khaybar so that when I die, I will die as a shaheed. I will receive the word of a shaheed. The messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, didn't die immediately. He died, as you know, a few years later on the 11th year after the migration, okay, when he returned from his farewell hajj. This incident was uh, on the seventh year, uh, the, the conquest of Khaybar, on the seventh year after the migration. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the companion said, shouldn't we kill her? He said, no. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pardoned her. Unless if anyone gets hurt. But Bishr ibn al-Bara, the companion who was with the Prophet, peace be upon him, ate from the sheep a few bites and he was poisoned badly and he was being treated for six months but after six months he died peace be upon him may Allah be pleased with him so the Prophet وسلم, ordered that woman of Khaybar the wife of Salam ibn Mishkam Zainab ibn al-Harith to be handed over to the family of Bishr ibn al-Bara uh, ibn Ma'roor in order to apply the qasas, which is the equality in punishment. And then later on, because as you know, it's even in the Torah. وَكَتَبَنَا عَلَيْهِمْ فِيهَا أَنَّ النَّفْسَ بِالنَّفْسِ Killing for killing. You kill somebody, you get killed. Unless if the family of the murdered pardon you. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered that woman to be handed over to the family of Bishr ibn al-Bara ibn Ma'roor. And then later on, she was executed. The catch in the hadith is how the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, after the sheep spoke to him while being cooked, O Prophet of Allah, do not taste me, there is poison inside of me. Yet the messenger of Allah pardoned the woman. And he said, provided no one is hurt. But when the companion died, then the qasas was due, unless if the family wanted to pardon. So how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led the greatest manners ever to the extent that he pardons the person who not intended to kill him and assassinate him actually did whatever it takes to poison the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after he trusted her and he accepted her invitation. There are a lot of ahkam by the way related to this particular incident such as the food, the meat, which is slaughtered by the people of the book is halal even if they don't say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim provided they do the tazkiyah or uh, the slaughtering. May the greatest peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi and it is time brothers and sisters to take a short break. We'll be inshallah back in a couple minutes. Please stay tuned. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the second segment in today's Gardens of the Pious program live all the way from our studio in Cairo and in this segment we have four different phone lines open and ready to receive your calls our first caller for the day is Musa from Azerbaijan Assalamu alaikum Musa Musa, can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead. Uh, if you wear socks and if small uh, thread from socks stick to your foot, does it go when putting your foot in water? I, I really don't understand what you mean. What do you mean a thread of the uh, sock sticks to your foot? Socks. 
Now you're yes. performing wudu and you realize that there was a thread remaining or left over from the sock between the toes for innocence? Uh, in general, uh, on the foot or under the foot. Well, if you're washing your feet, even if there is a thread or some cotton left over, it will be washed off. So that's something yeah. not to pay attention to. Uh, but if you don't use your hands, just dip your uh, limbs you should in the use water. Your, you should use your hand to rub your feet and wash your feet with your hand, as long as you're capable to do that. Okay? Barakallah okay. feet. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Ramiza from India. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello? Sheikh, Sister can you Ramiza, hear me? I hear you clearly, mashallah. Welcome to Huda TV. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, <coughs> Sheikh. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One uh, regarding the uh, ladies who is uh, conducting the prayer uh, by uh, so many are saying that the ladies should not conduct a uh, prayer so she should not lead the prayer many are confusing me sister so Ramiza, please explain me this, sister this. Yeah? a woman yeah. may pray in jama'ah and may lead the prayer with other women and instead of standing ahead of the line she stands in the middle of the line it's as simple as that so a muslim woman can pray in jama'ah if an imam is leading the prayer or praying jama'ah where only woman is leading women in the prayer. So she may be an imam of other women. Got it? Okay. Okay. And the second uh, second question is uh, regarding uh, a lady who was asking me, she has some jewelry with her to gift her uh, a uh, daughter-in-law. Mm. Uh, this she, ha she has in her intention. The next year she is going to give it, uh, give that to her uh, daughter-in-law. Mm. She is asking whether I have to give the zakah for this, as this year I am holding it. So should I give the zakah on behalf of her, or uh, it uh, this zakah will be uh, for her? Uh, I mean, she should pay for it. Mm -hmm. Well, what as, I should she yeah, do, she's Sister Ramiza, as long as she still keeps the gold with her, and it's been already uh, one lunar calendar, she should pay the zakah on it. If she happened to pay it to her before the due date of the payment of zakah, then she's not liable. The other person will begin a new haul, a new calendar from the day that she receives the jewelry. And also it is worth, uh, worthy of uh, mention here that there is a difference of opinion with regards to whether zakah is due on women's jewelry or not. We said Imam Abu Hanifa is of the opinion that a woman should pay zakah on her own jewelry. While the Jumhur, yani Malik was Shafi'i and Imam Ahmad are of the view that if she wears them on regular basis, then the jewelry will be perceived like clothes. Some clothes are very expensive. You don't pay zakah on your clothes, on your watch, on your... So likewise, she doesn't have to pay zakah on it. To be in the safe side and to give thanks and gratitude to Allah for what you have, it is best to follow the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa. In this regard, especially you have some uh, ahadith which I quoted and shared with you and discussed the reason of the difference of opinion between uh, the two schools of thoughts in this regard. Thank you, Sister Ramiza from India. Now, let me take another caller before I get back to uh, the hadith. Assalamu alaikum, Khadija. Sister Khadija from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Khadija, Assalamu okay. Alaikum. Alaikum Assalamu wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Sheikh, how are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing great. And yourself? Alhamdulillah. How can I help you, Sister uh, Khadija? Uh, yeah, Sheikh, I want you to give me more explanation on the verse that says, Walau sha'allahu ma'ashrafu. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. And my second question is, uh, is it uh, uh, permissible for one to make money from YouTube, Twitter, knowing that you have to put some money to get uh, your profit? W what do you mean? Put some money to do what? Like, do you have a YouTube channel where you actually um, uh, earn through ads or how? No, I I know that I learned that I'm not sure that you have to pay some money before you make money from the social apps. Pay some money towards what? To get what? Uh, to get to to, to 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 make money from one uh, handle like the Twitter. Now you pay some money for the premium premium. Well, if you're talking about in order to have an account, you pay money, this is permissible because somebody is offering a service, social media platform, mm -hmm. for instance, and uh, you are benefiting out of that. So the payment is permissible. But earning money from your social media materials, it depends on number one, what you offer, whether it's halal or haram, and number two, the ads mm -hmm. which are being uh, run on your channel or during your programs, whether the contents are halal or haram. Got it? Yes, sir. Barakallahu feekum. So, we have many verses in the Quran confirm that we don't have a Mashiach unless if Allah the Almighty wills. Mashiach means will. So, وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مَا أَشْرَكُوا As it is mentioned in Surah Al-An'am, I believe, chapter number 6. And also, وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَعَلَهُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً If Allah wills, He would have made them all one ummah, يعني have the same religion, same faith. وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ Such as in Surah Al-Insan. And you do not will unless if Allah wills. That all confirms that the Almighty Allah is the controller of all affairs. When it comes to the apparent meaning of the verse, some people may get confused and they said, Well, I didn't commit sins or I didn't disbelieve because I wanted to, but because Allah willed. No. وَلَا يَرْضَى لِعِبَادِهِ الْكُفْرِ Allah does not accept His servant that they should become disbelievers. So it means simply when Allah gave you as a human being the free choice and you misuse this free choice and you decided to disbelieve in Him or to associate others with Him Allah allowed this to happen because He gave you the free choice. Allah gave you the free choice. Did He have the power to stop you and make you a believer? Of course, and that's why I quoted in the second reference, لَجَعَلَهُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً If Allah wills, He would have made them all believers. وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مَا قَتَتَلُوا If Allah wills, they wouldn't have fought, they wouldn't have differed, they wouldn't have deviated from the straight path. Yet Allah does what He wants. What does it mean again? When Allah the Almighty said in Surah Al Ahzab, Inna وحملها الإنسان إنه كان ظلوما جهولا الأمانة التكاليف the ordainment do's and do not do's or believe or refuse to believe angels refused this أمانة comes with a package if you like to accept it then if you fulfill it you have an eternal reward in heaven but if you fail to fulfill it, you'll end up in hellfire. So the angel said, no, thank you. We don't want that. We don't even want to take a chance. We want to, uh, neither Jannah nor Nar. Heavens, earth, mountains, birds, animals, chose likewise. 
human beings and the jinn kind accepted it. Allah said, Al Insan agreed to bear this amana. So when he decides to disbelieve, it's his choice. Could Allah have stopped him and made him a believer? Yes, if he wants to. So why didn't he? Because he gave him the choice. So Allah allowed him, but it doesn't mean that Allah is not able to guide him or to make him righteous. But he gave him the choice, so let him enjoy his choice. Barakallahu feekum. Actually, we ran out of time for this session. I was very eager to finish the remaining two hadith in this chapter, especially with the verse of Khudi al-Afwa wa Murbil Urfi. But no problem. May Allah grant us a long life and good deeds to continue next episode, inshallah, with the remaining two hadith. That will be, inshallah, uh, Monday of the next week. Until then, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all, pardon us all, and forgive us all our sins. And don't forget to fast Mondays and Thursdays and the 13th, 14th, and 15th of Sha'ban, since this is a very praiseworthy time to observe fasting, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Till next time, subhanakallahum wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ulaik, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama taslima kathira. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our God is the greatest, the one and only glory to him. He born in humans to be the best. And give his best to religion to them So why did they ignore that? Forgiving all about him in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price so long, so long.